Uh, okay. So uh, now we're going to add another variable into the complexity here of what we've been talking about. So uh, all the things that we talked about, about decibels and inverse square law and dB loss over distance, that's still going to be part of our world now. But we're going to add another variable, and that is that the loudspeakers do not disperse the sound equally in all directions. Uh, and that is actually by design. We work very hard to get them to do that. Uh, to some extent, they do that uh, on their own, but we also help that along. And it's important that we understand how that works and how that gets documented, which is what we're going to talk about today. So uh, the first concept I want to kind of introduce to you is this concept of directivity index and directivity factor. And the point here is that you know part of the reason why we make loudspeakers directional is because it makes them louder. Because sound, things that make sound are naturally omnidirectional for the most part. And when we confine them and make them directional, they get louder because that energy that used to be going everywhere is now being focused in, in a narrower area. And therefore, the, in total, everything gets louder. OK? So uh, one of the ways that we talk about directivity and dispersion is in terms of how much louder it gets. And so the directivity index is a value in decibels representing that sound pressure level increase that you get by confining the sound. Uh, so you know, it, a directivity index of 3 dB would mean, oh, it got 3 dB louder because we made it directional. And the directivity factor is a ratio between the intensity when it was not confined and the intensity when it was confined. So if, it, if it's a directivity index of 3 dB, that means the directivity factor would be 2 to 1. Or sometimes they just say 2, because that's a, it's a doubling okay, to get a 3 dB. Uh, let me demonstrate. Uh, some of the ways that we make these things directional is by introducing walls <laughs> that block the sound. We put the loudspeakers inside of boxes and cabinets. We s slap horns to the front of them that control where the sound gets to go. These are just some of the ways we do that. Let's talk about walls as just one of the examples. So here is an example of a thing that makes sound. Uh, and the thing that makes sound is, is this. okay. And some distance away, represented by L, there is a sound pressure level meter over here. And we just measure how loud it is at that given distance of L. The actual distance is not important for purposes of this, uh, of the demonstration. But in this case, we are not confining this sound in any way. We're just letting it go everywhere that it wants to go. And therefore, our directivity index is 0 dB. Why? Because we're not confining it, and therefore it's not getting any louder as a result of confinement. So 0 dB increase. And the directivity factor is 1. And sometimes directivity factor is referred to as the Q, the Q of a loudspeaker or the Q of a horn. And in this case, it's 1, because we have a 1 to 1 ratio. We're not increasing or changing the level in any way. But what would happen if we took that same thing that makes a sound and just put it up against a wall? And we, let's assume, for purposes of this demonstration, that the wall is what's called an infinite baffle. In other words, it goes on forever. Okay? There's you know, functionally no end to it, and therefore the sound is not going to get around it. In that scenario, at the same distance away, when we measure it here, it would be, it, we, we would measure 3 dB louder or 3 dB more sound pressure level. And the reason for that is half of the energy that this thing generates that used to go the direction of the wall now can't go that way because the wall is stopping it. And therefore, it has to go the other way. 
It has to go, instead of back, it goes this way with the rest of it. So it's doubled on top of itself. And because of comb filtering, you don't get a perfect 6 dB. It's actually 3 dB. Uh, except for subwoofers, interestingly enough, because subwoofers, the wavelengths are so long that they don't comb filter. And so you get 6 dB when you put it in front of a wall. Just, that's just a little gee whiz thing. Yeah, Connor? So Yeah, we're, because of comb filtering, we're assuming it's, it's 3 and 10, not 6 and 20. Okay. Um, or half of 6 and 20. Yeah, yeah, basically. Okay. I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna That's why. That makes sense. That's why, it's because of comb filtering. The comb filtering reduces the overall level. Okay. Eric? Is this like a representation of it? Yeah. Yeah. So like I'm guessable, but like. Yeah, exactly. Well, what would happen if we then moved it down to the floor? And we introduced, now we've got an infinite wall and an infinite floor. Well, now we've doubled the sound on itself twice, OK? Because we have some energy that used to go that, this way that is now going here. We had some energy that used to go down towards the floor but is now going that way as well. And so it's doubled on itself twice, which means if we measure at that same distance away, now we get a 6 dB increase, uh, or a directivity index of 6 dB, so a plus 6. And in this case, the directivity factor is 4, or a Q of 4, because it's a 4 to 1 ratio from confined versus unconfined. OK? Now, what would happen if we introduced another wall in it? So now we've got. It's in the corner of a room. So we've got two infinite walls and one infinite floor. Well, now we fold it back onto itself three times. And therefore, at this spot, we have a 9 dB increase. Plus 9 dB is the directivity index. Directivity factor is 8, or a Q of 8, because there's an 8 to 1 ratio uh, between the intensity of the unconfined sound and the now confined sound. So basically, you get 3 dB for every wall that you introduced in the, into the scenario, except for subwoofers, where you would get 6 dB per wall, because they don't comb filter, OK? Uh, at least not because you put them up against a wall. It's not that subs don't comb filter. They can comb filter. They just don't comb filter against themselves when they're like 6 inches away from a wall, OK? Um, so the, the point here is for you to s understand that statement I made earlier that part of the reason why we make the sound, the loudspeakers directional is so they get louder. And we are in the business of making stuff louder. Okay, That's like literally all of the research and all of the money that is being put into sound equipment right now is being put into making things louder. And that's how it's been for the last 100 years. We have spent basically no money trying to figure out how to make things quieter at least not with sound equipment, right? There are some acousticians that have played around with that a little bit. But, but usually, they're in the business of making stuff louder as well. So it's really, this is all about making stuff louder. And because we make stuff louder, directivity helps us do that. Uh, because it would be a heck of a lot easier to just have everything be omnidirectional. Then everybody, then all the sound would just go everywhere, and we wouldn't have to pay so much attention to everything. But there's a huge benefit in making it directional, and that is it gets louder. Okay, everybody with me so far? So you're just limiting the directions of where the speaker is dispersing the sound. Exactly. So we're focusing all that energy into a narrower area, and therefore that same amount of energy makes a bigger difference in the area it's allowed to, pr to propagate. Okay. Interesting enough, there's a, there is a mathematical relationship between directivity index and Q. This is not something I'm going to make you do you know, math. Or, or, there's, there's not homework questions about this. But I'm just demonstrating the mathematical relationship between them. So directivity index equals 10 times the log of Q. And Q equals 10 to the power of the directivity index divided by 10. So this is just my way of showing you that 
you know, this concept is connected to things you've already learned, okay? All right, so now that we are able to make things directional, we have to have some way of talking about how they are directional. And of course, it's complicated. It's not as simple as just saying, well, this, we're going to focus the sound. It's not like a light where, you know, sound travels really slow relative to light. And therefore, confining it is really hard because of how, hard, how slow it moves. And so we, there's no shutter cut for sound. Okay, it doesn't exist. So it's not as simple as just saying, oh, we're going to focus it into a 40 degree area. And then there's no sound outside of that. No, it doesn't work that way. There's sound everywhere. What we're trying to do is focus most of the energy into this smaller area, and there will still be energy in other places. And so we have to have some way of talking about that and demonstrating that. This is one of them, and this is, this is probably the one that, until things like ease came around, this is the primary way that we looked at it. So this is called a polar plot. And what this does is it represents the loudspeaker dispersion or coverage in horizontal or vertical planes. Um, the disadvantage to polar plots is it's, a, it's not a super efficient way of demonstrating this information because it really only shows one frequency and one axis at a time. There are some tricks you can do to kind of like superimpose multiple graphs on top of it and get three or four frequencies at a time, but then it gets really hard to read. But let me see if I can uh, explain how this works. So what we're doing is we are sort of looking at this is probably, a, if this was a horizontal uh, polar plot, then you know the loudspeaker is basically here, okay, pointing out this direction towards zero. Zero degrees is called the on-axis point, okay? Now, and then it's got this 360-degree grid, and that's uh, labeled in angles, okay? And then the, the thick line represents the uh, dispersion of the loudspeaker at a given frequency. So this would be, you know, probably 1,000 hertz horizontal. So each of these lines on the grid represent a certain amount of decibel loss. Uh, sometimes it's 3 dB per line, sometimes it's 6 dB per line, Sometimes it's 5 dB per line. Uh, it just depends on who made the graph, and they'll usually tell you. There will be a little key at the bottom of the page saying, hey, every line, it's 6 dB per division, or 3 dB per division. So in this case, if I look at 90 degrees, you can see that the solid line intersects two divisions down from the on-axis point. The on-axis point is here, right? It's an, it intersects with that line. So there, I have crossed two divisions at 90 degrees. Which, and if this is 3 dB per division, then this particular loudspeaker is minus 6 dB at 90 degrees horizontal at 1 kilohertz, meaning 1 kilohertz will be 6 dB quieter when you go 90 degrees off at, away from the axis, assuming nothing else changes, like the distance stays the same. and everything else. Okay? Does that make sense? Eric? I know you said uh, either the lines would represent either um, 3 dB or uh, 6 dB. Uh, which one would you prefer? I mean, I don't make polar plots, so it doesn't matter. It just, you just have to make sure you know <laughs> when you're reading these. You just have to make sure that you go find the note that the person who made the graph wrote saying, how many dB per division, you know? Because there's no standard for it. Everybody does a different. So you just have to go read it. Okay. The nice thing about this graph is it's relatively easy to read. Um, and you do are able to get a decent amount of detail out of this. The problem is, in order to accurately represent what this thing does, you need a ton of these. Because you need one of these for every frequency that you care about. And you need two of them, one for horizontal and one for vertical. Okay, so you know it ends up being like page after page after page after page of polar plots. It's just like an entire manual full of these polar plots to represent the full performance of the loudspeaker. So that's there's some inefficiency there, but you know we these days 
we don't really do paper a whole lot, so it's just another click on a PDF, and that's no big whoop. But back in the days when it had to be printed out and shipped with the loudspeaker, that that wasn't that was something, right? That number of pages you had to ship was a lot. So this is just one way that we represent the directivity of the loudspeakers using a polar plot. Another way is called a beam width plot. Um, what a beam width plot does is it it is attempting to show you this principle that is very important to us, which is what we call the 6 dB down points. And the idea behind the 6 dB down point is, generally speaking, uh, your average listener who has not tried to train their ears is barely going to notice a difference when you make a 3 dB change. Okay, And therefore, your average person is going to require about a 6 dB difference before they really feel like, OK, something has definitely happened, right? 3 dB is something barely happened. And therefore, 6 dB is like, OK, something happened. And so what we try to do, in most cases, we're trying to have a, a 6 dB range around the area where the audience goes. So it's, it's probably not possible for every person in the audience to hear exactly the same level. But we want them to hear the same level within 6 dB, right? As long as there's not a 6 dB difference from one seat to another seat, then we're probably fine. So when we specify the coverage of a loudspeaker, maybe you've looked at spec sheets and you'll see it spec as, this is a 90 degree horizontal loudspeaker. Well, what that means, it doesn't mean there's no sound outside of 90 degrees. It just means that 90 degrees is where it's 6 dB quieter for some frequencies. Rarely is it all the frequencies. It's just some of the frequencies, and that's usually like 1K to 4K um, is probably you know, where that's controlled. So in those higher frequencies that are easy to control, you're going to lose 6 dB when you go outside, you know, more, more than 6 dB when you go outside that coverage area. So what this is showing you is what is the 6 dB down points, horizontal and vertical, for this last speaker per frequency. So the squares are the horizontal and the triangles are vertical. So on the horizontal axis here, we have frequency. And on the vertical axis here, we have the actual beam width in degrees. So what you'll see here is like at 100 hertz, this thing is, three, is omnidirectional. OK, there is no 6 dB down point. It's 360 degrees, OK? Uh, but if you look at 1 kilohertz, the beam width vertically is here, which is 100. Then we go 90, 80, 70, 90, 80, 70, 60. So this is 60 degrees vertical. And horizontal is here, which is probably, I would call that 85 degrees horizontal. OK? And you notice it's different per frequency. And that is common. OK? It's very rare that you see a loudspeaker that has the exact same dispersion for every frequency. Um, really doesn't happen very much. There's only one point, interestingly enough, where the dispersion is the same on both horizontal and vertical, and that is here around, let's see, 9, 8, 7, 6, about 6,500 hertz. And at that spot, it's 60. So at 6,500 hertz, it's 60 degrees by 60 degrees horizontal vertical. Make sense? OK. So what's on 60 dB if you were uh, 60 degrees um, horizontal and 60 degrees uh, vertical uh, from the speaker? What would it be? It, would it be negative 6 dB itself? Yeah, I mean, that probably means it's conical, um, but it doesn't always mean that. And this is one of the weaknesses of a lot of these graphs, is it really only tells you vertical and horizontal, it doesn't really tell you what's happening between there. You kind of have to infer that. Um, and there's various methods for doing that. I'm going to teach you one method, which my method is like overshoot a little bit. Um, and, then if, and then it'll only be better than your prediction. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, directivity plot. 
What this one does is this plots uh, directivity index and Q per frequency. So uh, vertical scale on the right side is Q, and vertical scale on the left side is directivity index. So you're ranging from 0 to 30 uh, with directivity index and 1 to 1,000 for Q, or directivity factor, and you can see what it is per frequency. Uh, this is typically what you would use for a horn. If you were going to, let's say you were going to build your own loudspeaker cabinet and you were going to buy a horn and slap it onto a compression driver, you would get a directivity plot like this for the horn because the horn is going to change the frequency response. Yes, it's also going to change the directivity of the high frequencies, but it is also going to change the frequency response. So this is going to tell you, like if you didn't use a crossover and didn't divide the frequencies, this is what would happen to your frequency response just because of how it's able to confine. And therefore, like if I was going to use this, I would want to, you know, filter out anything below 1500 hertz from this horn because that gets omnidirectional and the frequency response gets really wonky there. But it stays pretty consistent between 1500 hertz and 10 kilohertz. Okay, so that's, that's what I would want to use this horn for, is for that frequency range, because it's consistent directivity and consistent, you know, increase in loudness. Um, this is an isobars. Uh, DMB and L acoustics really like to use isobars. What isobars do is, this is, uh, this would be a horizontal or vertical axis, and it shows you per 6 dB and 12 dB down points per frequency, okay? So basically, once you hit this line, that is when it's 6 dB quieter, okay? So you've got angle on the vertical and frequency on the horizontal. So, you know, if we look at 2 kilohertz, which is here, it hits at 2 kilohertz, this thing hits 6 dB down, 30 degrees off axis. So I would call this 60 degree horizontal dispersion at 2 kilohertz, 30 degrees on either side. Now, if I go up to 4 kilohertz, it would be 40 degrees dispersion, uh, 20 degrees per side, so on and so forth. Uh, and then this line is minus 12 dB. So you would lose 12 dB at 2 kilohertz when you got 60 degrees off axis, or 120 degrees, you know, would be the full, the full cone for that, okay? So just another way of looking at it. Um, the reason that DMB and L acoustics like this is one of the things that they're really interested in is consistent pattern control across the frequency spectrum. And this is a way of showing that that's happening. So if, if this 6 dB down, ideally they want this 6 dB down point to be a straight line. And that means that you've got, you know, the dispersion is consistent across the frequency spectrum. That's what they're aiming for, is a straight line. Um, and they're getting awfully close with some of those, like, like DMB with some of those GSL line array boxes, I mean, that Chris showed us at Intensive Arts. They are getting awfully close to a straight line across the entire spectrum. I mean, I, at the rate they're going, I'd give them another 10 years and they'll have it, you know? <laughs> which is crazy. OK, this is called the family of off-axis frequency response curves. And the idea here is that because a loudspeaker's directivity is different per frequency. One way of thinking about directivity is not so much that it gets quieter when you move off axis, it's that the frequency response changes when you go off axis. So there are some frequencies when you move 30 degrees off axis from it, some frequencies won't get quieter at all, and others will. And so to the person sitting 60 degrees off axis, it's going to sound like the frequency response changed. Like there was a high shelf put on it and, re and reduced all the high frequencies. And so what this is doing is this is trying to show you how the frequency response changes at various off-axis intervals. So the solid line is the on-axis response. And the, da the small dashed line is 10 degrees. So at 10 degrees off-axis, you're getting a slight reduction here, slight reduction there. Maybe the infinitesimal reduction there. 
And then the, the thicker dashed line is 20 degrees, and you can see now we're dropping noticeable amounts at the high frequencies. So the frequency response is changing. The, the high frequencies are getting quieter, the low frequencies are staying the same. The dotted line is 30 degrees, and you can see now it's a pretty big difference. So that's another way of thinking about it when you're trying to figure out where to point the loudspeaker and what it's going to sound like at different places. It's not so much that it gets quieter, it's just that the frequency response changes. And at some point, the frequency response will have changed more than you want it to. Like, you know, we can tolerate a certain amount of change, but after it changes by 6 dB or so, uh, at any range of frequencies, at that point, it's like, well, OK, I would sort of like to not have that happen. I would like it, the frequency response to be more consistent. So this is a way of allowing you to visualize how the frequency response changes when you move off axis. OK? All right, everybody with me so far? Any questions? Is it off axis in general or like vertically or horizontally? It depends. Well, I mean, this would be a this would be either horizontal or vertical, and they would specify this. I mean, I've I've cropped this off, but they would say this is horizontal frequency response graph for off-axis, you know, response, and they would say horizontal or vertical. Um, so it depends on who made the graph and what they wanted to tell you, right? Well, you're typically, you're typically focusing on this range, OK? okay. And so, you know, yeah. This is probably marketed as a 60 degree horizontal or vertical coverage loudspeaker. Because, you know, we've dropped 6 dB, right? Between here and there is about 6 dB, right? Typically, for the most part, it's symmetrical. Although there are a few exceptions, depending on the way that the the, the drivers are laid out in the cabinet, which we'll see in a minute here. Um, but you can. But hopefully, what you're seeing is that that specification, when they say, "Oh, it's 60 degrees horizontal," that is a woefully incomplete description of what that loudspeaker does. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not even an oversimplification. It's just like, it's barely useful information. <laughs> because, in fact, some frequencies don't change at all at 60 degrees off axis for this loudspeaker. OK? Uh, and that's an important thing to remember, that it's, you know, it's just simply not that simple. It, you know, we just don't have the ability to control it that uniformly. So it's, it's far more complicated than that. So let me uh, show you something that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, so there's this phenomenon uh, regarding circular radiators. In other words, things that make sound that are circles, um, which tend to be how loudspeaker drivers are designed, for the most part. Loudspeaker drivers are circles, OK? Uh, not all of them, but most of them are circles. And when a circle tries to make sound, this very interesting thing happens, OK? Uh, its ability to be directional is about how large it is in diameter relative to the wavelength of the frequency it's producing, OK? So if in, in this scenario, this is like a half polar, polar plot, and these are 5 dB per division. So in this case, the diameter of the driver is significantly smaller than the wavelength of the sound, if, and, this, and specifically one fourth. Okay, so the driver is a fourth of the wavelength of the sound that's trying to come out of it, and in that case, it cannot control it. That sound, that frequency, will be omnidirectional coming out of that driver. It's just not the driver's not big enough to control it, and. Switching to a ratio where the diameter of the driver is half the size of the wavelength, 
it's still not able to be super directional, as you can see. It's not until the diameter of, the, of that circle is equal to the wavelength of the frequency it's trying to produce where it starts being able to control it. Okay? And it starts getting directional, as, you can, as shown here by this line. It's now, it's now getting narrower. And that kicks in when the diameter is equal to the wavelength. Okay? But it keeps getting narrower as the driver gets bigger. So when the diameter of the driver is twice as big as the wavelength, look how narrow it gets. When the diameter of the driver is four times the size of the wavelength, it gets even narrower. It's like a beam now. Six times, the diameter is six times the wavelength, even narrower. Why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons. One is that it is a myth that some that only big drivers can produce low frequencies and only small drivers can produce high frequencies. Um, that is a myth. And that myth exists because of the way we tend to see loudspeaker drivers you know, installed and designed into loudspeaker cabinets. But if you just think about it for a few seconds and think critically about that, you will realize that that is 100% not true. Because I am willing to bet that all of you have today listened to a loudspeaker driver that is producing all of the freak audible frequency spectrum at the same level. Can you think about when that has happened to you today? Yes. You've probably all had headphones or earbuds in your ear sometime today, and you have heard all the frequencies at the same level out of this tiny little driver that you stuck in your ear. Okay? And even in this scenario, the size of the driver has no impact on how loud the frequency can be at zero degrees. <laughs> right? At zero degrees, it's the same for every wavelength and every frequency. It's only when you go off axis that it starts to become an issue. So the primary reason why we use multiple drivers in a loudspeaker cabinet design is because of directivity. It's not, a, it's not because that driver can't produce the frequency. It's because that driver can't control that frequency. OK? Yes, Tanya. Two questions. Yes. A, what, what's a minor lows? And B, what exactly is a driver? I understand the so, of what this is happening, but what is it? A driver is the thing in the box, that circle in there, oh. that's loaded in a magnet that pushes and pulls on the air, oh. right? It drives the air, right? The lobes are, it's this interesting phenomenon that happens when it starts getting beamy like that. Um, you end up with these little spots where it, you know, starts getting louder again, right? So that's what the lobes are. Uh, so if you wanted to make a design a loudspeaker, for example, and you wanted it to have consistent directivity across a wide frequency spectrum. Uh, you could not do that with a single driver, could you? Based on what I've just told you. It wouldn't work, right? Every frequency would have a, dir a different directivity. But if you could introduce multiple drivers and somehow subdivide the frequency spectrum so that each driver was only reproducing frequencies whose wavelengths were similar in size to that driver, then Collectively, they could produce the entire fre frequency spectrum, but do it with some consistent directivity. Okay, uh, and that's the biggest reason why we have multiple drivers per loudspeaker, is is so that we can get directivity to happen. Yes. Is that also the reason there are multiple drivers within like cars? Because yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that happens is remember we are not very sensitive to low frequencies. Okay, our hearing system has never needed to be good at that. 
okay, in order for us to stay alive and communicate with each other, right? Um, and so, and that's our, our, our hearing system is designed to keep us alive and allow us to communicate. The keep us alive part is hearing things that can kill us, right? And where those things are coming from. And for example, like, uh, we, had, we are not very good at hearing the difference between something up here and something down here. That's hard for us. We can kind of do it, but we can't do it anywhere, with anywhere near the level of resolution as we can do the difference between something coming from here and something coming from here. Why? Because the things that kill us don't tend to come from the air. <laughs> the things that kill us tend to come <laughs> from the sides and behind us, right? And so our ears are mounted this way so that we're really good at hearing when something's coming from here towards us to kill us, right? Not very good at hearing when something's coming up from here down to kill us, right? Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so we're, so that's the, that's the way that our ears keep us alive. Our ears allow us to communicate because they focus on the frequencies that contribute most to intelligibility and our ability to understand each other. And low frequencies don't help with that. And so our, our ears have naturally decided, OK, well, I don't have to be good at that because that doesn't help me communicate. Eric's got a question first. Yeah. Um, well, kind of, but this, this one has a horn on it for the high frequency driver, which helps oh, wa okay. take that, what would normally be a laser beamy frequency and widen it out. That's one thing horns do. I think I was just focusing on the driver there. So. Yeah. But yes, if it was just a circular driver, yeah, a really high frequency would just phew, beam right out of it. Okay. It would be very quiet off axis. Uh, so. But because we're not super sensitive to low frequencies, it, we require much higher amplitudes for low frequencies in order for it to sound the same. And therefore, that's where the big drivers really come in handy, because a really big driver is going to tend to have a really thick cone and magnet on it, and therefore can push and pull the air. It, it can exert farther. And when it exerts farther, it's compressing the, the air and refracting the air more. And that results in louder sound. So it's not that, it's not that the, the smaller driver produces that low frequency quieter. It's just that, the, you know, I mean, it does, but it's not producing it any quieter than it's producing the higher frequencies. It's just that we don't hear those low frequencies as well as we hear the high frequencies. And therefore, we need the low frequencies to be louder, right? It's not that the, that the small driver is bad at making low frequencies. It's just we're bad at hearing them. <laughs> OK? So is that why with a, like, a person with a deeper voice has to like, speak louder? Yeah. In high school, there was a kid with like, a really bad voice. And yep. He had, like, kind of had to scream for the rest of his stuff. Yeah, that's why. Because <laughs> we're really bad at you know, making sense out of low frequency sounds. OK? Uh, so let me show you an example of what can happen when you start using this idea of multiple drivers and only allowing s frequencies through those drivers that are similar in size to the wavelengths. Here is a group of polar plots for a loudspeaker that has two circular radiators in it. In fact, it's, it's a D and B E zero. So it has like a four inch driver and then a little one inch driver in front of it. And they subdivide the frequency spectrum accordingly. And you can see that uh, at some point, now this is, uh, I'm using diameter here to refer to the low frequency driver, if that was the only one. But since we let the, high, the small driver kick in at these higher frequencies, it doesn't laser beam. You see that? It stays a little wider. So obviously, we can't control the low frequency super well still, because that's still a pretty small driver. But Eventually, we kick into this area where it can control it, and that's pretty good. And then, it, and then it gets narrow. And then from here, at this point, we hand it off to the smaller driver. We hand the, the frequency spectrum off to that smaller driver, 
and it takes over and is able to maintain the same directivity that this one was able to. Okay, so multiple drivers were required to pull this off. Okay, that's the main reason why we use multiple drivers. Okay, are we good? Ready with me? Any more questions? Ah, yes, I'm going to do that right now. So, so yes, now I'm going to show you. Now I'm going to show you how, what you might be able to do with a polar plot. So here is a loudspeaker from Electro Voice uh, that is marketed as a 60 degree, 60 degree horizontal by 60 degree vertical loudspeaker. Okay, which now we understand is a gross oversimplification. <laughs> okay, yes. That means that the 6 dB down points are 60 degrees apart from each other. So you go 30 degrees off from on axis and it will be 6 dB quieter on either side. Okay? Uh, yeah. But that's not at every frequency. It can't be. So what frequency is it? Right? This is just such a gross oversimplification. Um, this is marketing people like simple things because it's easier to market a simple concept than it is to market a complicated concept. And so they'll oversimplify it for purposes of marketing so that people will be like, oh, yeah, 60 degrees. That's about the area I have to cover. Good. I'm good to go. It's like, well, no, it's just not that simple. Um, and that's why people get paid lots of money to, do, to design sound systems because it's, it's just more complicated than that. Uh, so. If you actually get into the details here and start looking at this, hey, look, here's that horizontal, that off-axis frequency response graph I used earlier. And sure enough, it is for the horizontal axis. And sure enough, this is for a 60 degree horizontal coverage loudspeaker, just like we thought, okay? So here's a lot of the different uh, plots that we, that we saw. However, eventually we get to the polar plots. Now what's happening here is in order to not have this be 100 pages, they are, trying to show us four frequencies at a time on here, OK? So I've got, let's say we were going to do something in the Stevens Center, OK? So here's a, a section view of the Stevens Center. And there's a little truss that is hung in the Stevens Center right here, which would be really easy for us to hang, on to, to hang something onto. So let's say we wanted to use that EV Electro Voice loudspeaker hang it on this truss and shoot it at this. And let's, let's, for purposes of demonstration, let's assume the balcony is not there. Or at least that we're not worrying about sending sound up there. No one gets to sit up there right now anyway, because the building's falling apart. So it's fine. OK, it actually tracks. So uh, yeah, it is my, I, I took a chunk out of that building myself with one of my sound cues. Um, I should have, yeah. <laughs> OK, so if you, uh, if you had an oversimplistic understanding of how sound works, you might just do this. Say, OK, well, this is the area I have to cover. Front row to back row, right? And that, what is that angle? Forty-eight degrees. Okay. That was that was measure geometry. So MEA enter, and then I did A for angle. Gotcha. Okay. And then I click, click, and I get the angle. Okay. Forty-eight degrees. Okay. Well, forty-eight degrees is less than sixty, <laughs> right? And so we're probably in good shape, right? I've got a 60 degree coverage last speaker. We'll call it a day. No problem. This will work just fine. Great. OK. Well, let's plot it and see. OK? So we hang it here. We point it at the middle of that area. And we think, OK, it's a, it's a 40, that's a 48 degree area. I've got a 60 degree coverage. This is going to work. OK. Well, let's see. Um, we've got to start keeping track of some information here. So I'm going to pull up 
my trusty Excel. And I'm going to make a column here for seat A, seat B, and seat C. So the first thing I want to know is we have to consider the dB loss over distance, OK? Because that will play a factor here as well. Because these seats are not all the same distance away from the last speaker. That's the first thing to remember. So distance. So I'm just going to measure the distance. So how far away is this from this? 25 feet. OK, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to scale this thing. Decimal. I taught you all how to do that in CAD class. <laughs> Except for Thania. You just You just uh let's see. You just do it. You just select everything, scale by one twelfth and then change your units to decimal. OK? So there we go. Now, now this will make more sense. Measure distance OK, from here to there. OK, that is 33.19 feet. OK? Well, let's try that again. This time we'll go from there to there. That is 50.1664. Yeah. Let's see. It's OK. I am too. Is that better? OK. OK, distance to seat C is there to there. 78.8. Eight or seventy six point eight. Okay. And so now I want to do DB loss. Uh, for distance. So if I'm aiming at seat B, um, well. Let's just do all of them, OK? So I'm going to, this will be 20, actually, let me do a little formula here. 20 times the log 10 of uh, 3.28, because that's a meter. That's where we start from, divided by that distance um, too many arguments for this function oh 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 I know I know what I did wrong divided by there we go okay so I lose 20 dB going from one meter to the front row. I didn't know Excel could do that. That's crazy. This is, this is what Excel does. <laughs> and then I can just drag this out, and it copies that formula and updates the, it accordingly. And now I've got the dB loss for all three seats. OK? Yeah, 20 times the log, uh, log 10 of 3.28 divided by the distance that I measured. You, you should know that math, right? I look at Excel, too. It's awesome. OK. So the next thing I would like to know is the angle off axis for each of these seats. OK? So um, off axis, angle. 
Well, for seat B, it's 0, right? Because I am pointing at seat B. Okay. Well, what would the angle be to seat A? You all right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to do another angle measurement to seat A from B. 33 degrees, it says. So I'll put that in here, 33 degrees. And then I'll do this again, and I'll do to seat C. So I'll do this line to that line. OK, that's 15 degrees. OK. Um, and then just for the sake of simplicity, because I don't want to completely overwhelm you, we're going to focus on one frequency. Okay? And we're just going to do one kilohertz, because one kilohertz is usually where the last speaker starts to become directional for most cabinets. Okay? So this is 1,000 hertz. OK. So at seat A, I am 33 degrees off axis. So how much will I lose at 1,000 hertz? Well, let's take a look here. So this is our vertical polar plot on this side. And that's what we're looking at, because we're, look, we're looking at a cross section, so we're interested in the vertical dispersion. Well, say what? Because it says. <laughs> well, because you know the last speaker is pointed here. And when I go to here, I am moving below the loudspeaker. Right? Okay. That makes sense? Yes. OK. So I'm looking for vertical coverage. Yeah. Now, it's the orange dashed line that represents 1 kilohertz. And you know, so we can say that's 0 degrees, OK, is, is seat B. And there's no reduction because it's on axis. And we're going to go 30. 3 degrees, according to my measurement. Well, there's 30. So 33 degrees would be about here. Well, how many dB per division are these plots? At the bottom it says 6. It does, doesn't it? So we have not gone 6 dB yet, have we? <coughs> we have gone 3 to 4 dB, it looks like. Probably about 4, okay. right? Because this is 0 dB. This is 6 dB down. And the orange line is here at 33. So it hasn't quite intersected with the 6 dB line. So it's somewhere between 0 dB and minus 6 dB. And it's a little bit past what I would say the midpoint is. So I'm going to say minus 4 dB. OK? There's a little margin of error here. This is 0 degrees, so that is where the last speaker is pointed. And when I go to the front row, I'm going down that way, right? OK? So this would be minus 4. So I lose minus 4 at seat A. I lose nothing at seat B from directivity because I'm on axis. Well, what about seat C? Well, at seat C, I'm 15 degrees up. So 15 degrees would be halfway here. And whoa, look at that big dip. So this is Connor's question about, well, isn't it, do we just assume it's symmetrical? And yeah, generally. But here's this funny thing that happens with loudspeakers that are designed like this, where you've got a big low frequency driver on the bottom and a horn on the top. Uh, I guarantee you 1 kilohertz is around where the crossover is. So that's, that's the frequency where we start the handoff between the low frequency to the high frequency. And so both drivers are producing that frequency. And, when, and they are offset a little bit in distance, right? And you go a certain angle, and their distance will represent half a wavelength at 1 kilohertz. And so there will be a slight cancellation there that is not there on the other side because of the directivity of the horn. OK? And so you get this weird dip here. OK? Now, for purposes, uh, we, that's only going to happen at that one frequency. It's just a weird anomaly at that one frequency, and it's a very narrow area where that happens. So we can, for purposes of, of us just like figuring this out, 
we can infer and, just, and just that that dip isn't there, okay? So we can just say, okay, well, it's really probably there, right? <laughs> okay, just for fun, right? Uh, and so at that point, it, you know, it actually probably sticks out a little bit. So at 15 degrees, I'm maybe minus five at that point, okay? I'm not gonna count the, the weird dip, okay? Um, so I would be minus five. Okay, so now we do total loss. Um, so uh, for total loss, what we're gonna do is this is going to be, uh, this, uh, this frequency is the reference point, right? So we're gonna do this minus this, and there is a 3 dB, actually it would be the other way around, wouldn't it? It'd be a plus, because we're doing, ah, uh, what did I do? Let me try that again. I think it would be this minus this. There we go, now I got a positive number, okay? Because I know it'll be a positive number because it's closer. 20 feet is closer than 23 feet. Or 20, 20 dB it represents closer than 23 dB, right? So it would be 3 dB louder at the front row. But I also need to include the directivity, don't I? So in this case, I want to say plus whatever that number is. And I'm just doing plus because I know it's a negative number, therefore the subtraction is, will, will kick in, okay? So it's a total of, wait, did I do that right? It would still be negative, wouldn't it? No, it'd be plus. I don't know, I might be trying to get too fancy here. Um, so, Three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. I might need to get this in the right order here. Let's try this. Would it be, would it work if I did that? False. <laughs> okay, I don't wanna wrestle with this too long. Let's just do it this way. So we're doing, uh, this is a three dB difference. So we get a, oh no, that was right, it was right. Because it's a three dB louder here, but then we lose four dB off of that. Yeah, so it was right. When I, ha I had it before, it was right. Okay, so that's right. So I, it got louder because I got closer, but then it got quieter because I went off axis. Okay, so that's what it is. This is a zero loss, okay. Now this one would be, uh, um, I'm gonna need to put something there to make it not move that middle one. But I can then just copy this to here. Now, the back row is eight and a half dB quieter, okay? And we could do that math just in our head, right? We can see from 23 negative 23 to negative 27, that's like minus four. And then I've got, I take another five dB off of that. And that's where I get to the eight and a half, right? So I'm losing a total of eight dB going to the back row. I have a much bigger difference here than six dB, which is what I normally want, right? I only want a six dB difference. But in this case, I have an eight dB difference. Okay, well, um, okay. Well, what if I did this again? Let's try it a different way. I'm about to teach you a trick. And this trick is what separates the amateurs from the professionals, okay? What we just did is what amateurs do, okay? Amateurs will aim their loudspeaker at seat B. And it's not an unreasonable conclusion. I mean, we, that, that, that 
assumption came from somewhere. We measured the angle and it was like, oh, 48 degrees. We've got a 60 degree cabinet. Let's aim it at the center, it'll cover everything. But that doesn't account for the dB loss over distance, right? So professionals will always aim towards the back row. You were absolutely right. So professionals will usually aim towards the back row. And I will show you why that is. So let's, let's do that now. So the good news is the distance and the dB loss over distance are the same. But the off-axis angle, so I'm going to do back row off-axis. In this case, the angle's 0 here, right? And it is minus 15 here, because we already measured that angle, OK? But now we just got to measure the angle between back row and front row, which we, I think it was, was it 48? Let's just yeah. confirm. So from here to here, 48 degrees. So this will be minus 48 degrees. OK, those are the angles now. OK, uh, so 1 kilohertz will be no loss there for directivity, right? Well, what happens when we go 15 degrees down? 15 degrees down is here. Uh, we've maybe gone 1 dB. OK, so I'll say minus 1. And what if we go 48 degrees? Well, OK, there's 30. This would be 60, right? So 50 would be here, 40 would be here, 48 would be right around here, right? That's right where the 60 dB mark is. OK, it's crossing that 60 dB line. You see it? This orange line intersects with this thin line here, right? around that 48 degrees. So it's about 6 dB down there. Might be 7, but it's fine. It, 6 or 7, it's still going to work. OK? So we'll do 6. OK. Uh, Jason? Yeah. So the previous one when you were aiming at, um, at point B, um, were you referring to the uh, line that's slightly less orange than the one that's really orange? I'm looking at. It's it's both the dash the dash thing that that dash dot dash line it's in, it's that light orange. Because I think I wasn't sure if uh, for when you were aiming it at uh, 16 degrees, uh, it was less than negative five. Well, at 15 degrees, I'm just sort of it's right in this gap, right? Yeah, it's this, right? Yeah, we said we were going to ignore that dip because that's the dip that happens because of the interaction between the two drivers at one kilohertz. So yes, we're ignoring that. Yeah, I usually ignore it because it happens at this one little spot and nowhere else, right? So it doesn't really matter. I mean, it kind of matters, but yeah, it, it's functionally, it's not super important. OK, so back row total loss now. So let's take a look at this now. So if I, um, I'm i going to do, uh, that value minus that value, OK? So here we get the 3 dB, right, which we know we already had before. This is We already know that seat A is 3 dB louder. OK? Um, but in reality, what I want to compare this to is the back row. So I really want to compare this against D3. And there's a, it's 7 dB louder, right? And that tracks, because minus 27 versus minus 20. So it's 7 dB louder. But then what we did is we added the directivity loss, OK? So I'm going to add my, six, my negative 6 dB directivity loss. And I get that, OK? Now, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to put a dollar sign here and a dollar sign there. And what that means is when I copy this cell, don't increment that value. Keep that in the same spot, but move the everything else to one column over, OK? So uh, now I'm going to just take this, copy and paste. And now it's doing C3 against. Uh, Oh, wait, no, I, I did the wrong spot, didn't I? No, that's right. Yeah, that is right. You're right. OK, so this is this one against this one and including that, OK? And I, that's 2 dB difference, OK? Well, and this one's 0. We know that. OK, I now have within 3 dB between front and back row as compared to almost 9 dB The only thing I did was I pointed it slightly differently. Same loudspeaker. And what happened is I aimed it at the back row. So why does aiming it at the back row work? Well, because the back row is the on axis, right? We're aiming it there, and therefore there's, you know, we're no, no directivity loss there. But that is the spot where we're losing the most over distance. Right, because it's the farthest away. So we aim it there. And then as we go towards the, first, the front row, we are getting closer to the loudspeaker, aren't we? And because we're getting closer, we're losing less. OK? So when we get to, we already know that there's about a 6 to 7 dB difference between the front row and back row because of distance. Why? Because the distance is from the front row to the loudspeaker is almost is about half as far as the distance to the back row. And that's a 6 dB difference. We know that, right? Because of inverse square law. So already the front row is going to be 6 dB louder than the back row just because of the distance. So as we're going to the front row, we're getting 6 dB louder. But we are also at the same time going off axis from the loudspeaker. Right? So while we are getting quiet closer to the loudspeaker, the loudspeaker is getting quieter because of the angle. We, the distance is getting closer, but the angle is getting quieter. And they are, that is happening proportional, which means that front row is both the 6 dB up point for distance and the 6 dB down point for directivity ish. And therefore, the front row hears the same thing as the back row. Uh, and this is why professionals aim at the back row. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to hang your loudspeaker in the spot where that front row is half the distance from the loudspeaker as the back row. So you're going to find that spot. Where do I hang it so that those distances have that ratio? And then you measure the distance, the angle between front row and back row. And I will do that one more time. Here to there. And I get 48 degrees. OK? So if I know I'm going to aim at the back row, in a perfect world, I would, then, I would therefore want a loudspeaker that had a almost 100 degree dispersion, right? So that I can use the half of that to cover the area of my seats. And the other half just goes to the ceiling and no one cares about that, right? <laughs> but I hit the 6 dB down point at the front row. And I want that to be the 6 dB down point. And therefore, at 48 degrees, I need a 100 degree vertical spec loudspeaker. OK? So I look for the spec sheets like I have something that's 100 degrees. OK, find that. Then you start doing the plots and look at it per frequency. Now, we would have to repeat this for multiple frequencies to really get a clear picture of whether this was a good idea or not with this loudspeaker. I think we'd find we'd want something a little bit you know, wider dispersion on the vertical. Uh, if we looked at some of the higher frequencies, this may not work as well. Uh, but that's the goal. 
That's, that's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to hang it in a spot where those distances have that two to one ratio. And then find a loudspeaker whose dispersion is double that angle. And this is why you have to be very, very careful about letting people convince you to move it. Okay, so you're gonna figure all this out and the people who don't have a very clear understanding of how this stuff works are gonna think it's not really that big of a deal for you to move it a little bit. When in reality, it's kind of a really big deal. Moving it just a little bit could be enough to break this whole thing, like this whole little trick that we're doing. And so you gotta learn, I mean, we all have to work together and everybody wants to be in that exact same spot. Scenery always wants to put something in that spot. Lighting always wants to put something in that spot. Sound always wants to put something in that spot. It's like the, the prime spot, right, in this case. Everybody wants to go there. Um, and you've got to understand what you're giving up if you, and you got to understand what everyone else is giving up. Because <laughs> if you can't all be in that exact same spot, then somebody's going to have to move. And you bet got to understand what each person is going to give up by moving. And you got to have that conversation. And, you know, in this scenario, moving one foot left or right is not going to change this right? But moving one foot farther downstage could very much change this. <laughs> so one foot in a certain direction may not be a big of a deal, but one foot in a different direction could be the difference between it working and not working. So you got to understand where you can give and where you can't give. And now we would have to also plot the horizontal coverage to understand what would happen if we moved one foot left or right. We'd have to see if that would make a big difference. That's what we're going to do on Thursday, is I'm going to show you how to plot the horizontal coverage. Uh, and that'll be your, your homework. But, uh, so you'd have to figure that part out, too. But it's very important to understand what, how you got the results you got. Because nowadays, we don't do this all manually like this anymore. We don't really look at the polar plots anymore. We don't really do this math manually. We just use something like Ease or Array Calc or Sound Vision or something. And we just draw the room in 3D and we put virtual loudspeaker files and it just like paints the sound and it tells us how loud it's gonna be. But the principles are the same. You still have to understand how that, those results are being derived so that you understand how to fix it. And if you don't understand how it works, then you're never gonna, that tool is useless to you. If you don't understand this idea between how dispersion relates to inverse square law. And if you understand the relationship be between those two things, then you can get a tool like Ease or array calc or sound vision or a map or whatever, and you will understand how you can manipulate the variables inside of that computer to get better results. And so that is why I'm making you do it this way at first before I teach you how to use, how to let the computer do it for you, because the computer is just gonna do all that busy work math for you that I'm doing in the spreadsheet. But you still have to make the decisions and you still have to understand the consequences of the decisions you make. So uh, that's why I'm, it's, I think it's still important to kind of learn this manual method of calculating it so you get how these relationships work. Okay, questions? Could we start the homework after today and at least be able to plot the vertical? You could. You could probably plot the vertical based on what I've taught you today. Um, the horizontal is a little gnarlier, so we're going to get to that on Thursday. Right. Um, we have to do a little bit of trigonometry to, to figure that out. Um, it's just Pythagorean theorem, not too bad, but um, but you got to you got a little do a little bit of triangle math. Uh, so uh, so we'll, anyway, we'll go over that on Thursday. And then it's due next week, Tuesday, the twenty seventh. Monday. Next Monday. Yeah. So you'll have the weekend to work on it. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Is this making sense? Yeah. For like first time seeing it, yes. Yeah? It's going to be a lot of like just looking at it. It makes sense after you did this. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's when you just explained it, I'm like, why are the eyes out? Yeah. yeah. But this made more sense. Okay. But you see how this information, you use this information to apply to this scenario, and you can get actual answers out of it. I'm using Excel just to do some of the math for me, so I don't have to do it a million times. I just do it once and copy it over. Right? You don't have to do that if you don't want to. You can do all the math manually and just type it in, but I like letting my tools work for me. <laughs> uh, so, other questions? You can get it for free as a student. You go to autodesk.com and sign up for an account. There's an education account access. You have to put your .edu email address in, and they will give you a free copy of everything they make. Yeah. But you can do it in Vectorworks if you want. That's fine. I don't really care. I mean, I'm giving you a DWG file, so you'd have to get somebody to like save that as a as a DXF or something, and then you could pull it into Vectorworks and go. So anyway. So I mean, now I know where you are. 